Hey guys, this is Bonsert. Ever wanted to get into the books that I'm writing? Please watch the end of this video for a special Black Friday offer. Radio Retro Future. Ah, steampunk cities. In this two-part series, we'll first be answering the question, what is a city? You're probably familiar with the phrase Silent Green is people! We've got to stop This them. is from Soylent Green, which in turn in was inspired by the book Make Room, Make Room by Harry Henderson. Both are dystopian settings about massive overpopulation. All the way back to the 60s, overpopulation was a big bugbear as it is today. But was this alarmist prediction justified? As is the Machine Stops from 1909 by E.M. Forrester. It describes well today. Reading this story during the Kuf era was rather unnerving, as it describes a dying humanity. But not due to some cataclysm, but due to comfort and how we take such luxuries for granted. And today, we'll explore who of these two authors have made the best prediction about what is awaiting humanity in the near future. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I am Danket Lexicon. Over the last few months, we had several requests to make videos on steampunk settlements. But what are they? If you look for steampunk cities, you'll get images of fantasy cities with gas lamps and airships. And of course, Cogwheels bigger than the city itself. I'm sure they're good for something. Of course, here on Radio Retro Future, we want to know what makes steampunk cities unique and how you can incorporate the aesthetics of steampunk in your world building. Thus, we also need to talk about genre writing. But for this to make sense, I highly recommend you watch our last two videos on high concept world design because it will come up a lot. Before we can discuss what makes steampunk cities distinct from those in other genres, we need to answer the question, what is a city? In part one of this series, we'll focus on the phenomena of cities in a social and political context before we delve further into their topographical qualities. And of course, if you don't want to miss our next episode, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe so you'll be notified on any future updates. In our description, we also have a link where you can subscribe to our newsletter so you can explore our other steampunk related projects. And to demonstrate this, we're going to the Netherlands. Around 1230, the Count of Holland built a haunting lodge near the west coast of the County of Holland. This is not some cabin used for the Count's leisure, but a fort to oversee this corner of his territories and to counter poaching. He would hold court here and found offices for his administration and, more importantly, archives. Today, his haunting lodge is known as the Ridderhof in Den Haag, the seat of Dutch Parliament. The Hague is a city with a special status in the world, both being home to the Palace of Peace and the seat of the International Court of Human Rights, among many other prestigious international institutions. Surely, this place with over half a million souls is a metropolitan city. But it's not. In the Dutch, at most of Europe's context, The Hague isn't considered a city. Now, how could that be possible? And for that, we need to go back in time. Once all humans were nomads living off the land, but then they discovered how to grow their own food in the same place, allowing the first permanent settlements to form. Then they learned how to store food safely in pots, and that's when they discovered it could be transported inside these pots on boats, donkeys, and eventually carts, allowing the founding of new colonies and trade with other settlements. Typically, early cities would be founded near water, be it rivers or the sea. In rare cases, these would be founded near land-based crossroads, as access to water is crucial for any settlement. It's also easier to carry large cargo across the water than it is across the land. It's one of the reasons that places like the Netherlands, with a high concentration of river deltas, have always been heavily urbanized. 
In the Middle Ages, these settlements were located on land that belonged to feudal nobility. This nobility was responsible for protecting the settlements and settling disputes between the subjects. However, as these settlements grew larger, the city's inhabitants demanded the right to organize markets, protect themselves by building walls and raise militias. Thus, the noble would sell these settlements the right to build walls, hold their own courts inside those walls, and of course, to conduct commerce however they pleased. These rights are known today as stadsrechten, or as they are called in English, town privileges or borough rights. Settlements that owned such privileges became the first cities. Thus being a city is a status granted by feudal privilege, kinda like restaurants having Michelin star. The point is that cities are not purely geographical features, as they are more commonly known today. They are fortified settlements that could project more military and economic power than other settlements. It's for this reason that many European cities still show off the city charters in public displays to this day. The Hague, however, was the Count's own property and therefore needed no such rights. The Hague's unique development as a governmental and administrative centre gives it a distinct character among Dutch cities. Its foundation and growth are deeply tied to the political and administrative history of the Netherlands. For example, The Hague received permission to build its wall in 1530 from the Estates General, the medieval precursor to the Dutch Parliament, meaning that The Hague was recognized as a settlement of importance by the aligned provinces rather than enjoying feudal privileges as the city's head. The wall, however, would never be built, as the money was instead invested in a new town hall that stands to this day. Was the city as a status still relevant after the Middle Ages? Well, it was for Western Europe, as these charters symbolized the city's independence from foreign rulers. Since the Middle Ages, cities had their own laws, measurements, coinage and foreign policy. Since the 16th century, nation building had gone through various phases, during which rulers made it a priority to take this autonomy away and make the citizens national subjects. This would, in turn, lead to many wars, such as the 80 Years War for Dutch independence from the Spanish crown. This ironically led to the creation of the Republic, that would take the responsibility for foreign policies away from the cities. That said, the cities were all represented in the Estates General, thus still had a great influence on the nation overall. This tradition of rule by consensus is still very prevalent in Dutch culture and is one of the reasons the Netherlands has been one of the most egalitarian societies in the world. If you'd like to know more about this era, our upcoming TTRPG Nightwatch will contain much more historical facts about the Netherlands, as does our lore series on YouTube that delves deeper into the tumultuous age of Europe and how it shaped the map of today. So yes, by getting our game you won't just get a steampunk RPG, you'll learn actual history and live it in Nightwatch. For instance, various areas in Europe all have their own path to the creation of their nation states, but one man more than others is responsible for the further developments. Napoleon Bonaparte, the man who brought all the European powers to their knees, also exported French liberalism to its subject states, introducing many institutions we take for granted today, such as a constitution, civil registration and the metric system. But back to the cities. By the end of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution changed how we look at cities forever. I need to make a video on the Industrial Revolution because it's not what most people think. The common perception is that the invention of the steam engine led to this technological revolution, but this is but one piece of a massive puzzle. If you were born by 1775 in England, you would have witnessed one of the biggest technological and demographic shifts since the Bronze Age or the fall of Rome. In 1750, an estimated 50% of the population lived in an urban environment. By 1850, this was 50%. 
Railroads and innovations in agriculture reduce the need for agricultural labor, and on top of that, the abundance of food led to a population boom. Many rural workers moved to the cities to find jobs, leading to a massive surplus of cheap, unschooled labor. In the meantime, maritime trade and overseas colonies provided new commercial opportunities. Entrepreneurs jumped on this opportunity to create buildings that we know today as factories. But there is a problem. Remember those town charters? The medieval institutions were still a thing at this point, particularly the guilds. You could say they were like unions, but they were very powerful within the city's limits. And they saw this influx of rural peasants as a threat to their business, which was pretty much based on family-based cottage industries and maybe some small factories to run according to formal master-apprentice style principles. And one thing that the guilds hated was competition. For example, after the Black Death of the 14th century, women became more active as guild members because of the shortage of workers. However, this meant that the next generation of male apprentices couldn't get any work because the competition was too high. Thus, the guilds banned women from working in any guild capacity, meaning that they didn't get to work at all. Thus, centuries later, when these entrepreneurs arrived at the city gate with their new fangled production techniques, innovation and plap laborers, the guilds did everything in their power to keep them out of the city. So these entrepreneurs did what they do best and took their businesses to the countryside, founded their factories in fishing villages or mining towns and built whole settlements around them. Long story short, it was the end of the guild's institutional power, reducing them to formal of religious work organizations. Others turned into labor unions as we know them today. Yes, despite common belief, the first unions weren't socialists. Hell, the socialists attempted to bring back the guilds during the era, like William Morris, whom we discussed in our video on the arts and craft movement. His guild of St. George still exists today, by the way. This brings me to another often overlooked subject, cities and demographics. Let's return to the Middle Ages for a moment. At this time, all societies were agricultural, meaning that people were mostly producing food for themselves. What remained would be sold at local markets, from where it would be sold to the cities. If there was a poor harvest in the countryside, the cities would starve unless they found another source of food. Rome, for instance, was notoriously dependent on Egypt for grain. The thing of cities is that they didn't produce much at the time. And although there were guilds and craftsmen, all their resources needed to be imported, including people. You see, throughout the majority of history, cities always had below replacement birth rates. The 19th century and early 20th century are the exception to this, not the rule. So, when people worry about declining birth rates in most places of the world, well, what did you expect would happen? Some historians have described medieval cities as parasites, taking from the country whatever they could to survive. And they're not wrong. Traditionally, cities are service centers. They provide markets, logistics, and later on, capital. When it came to actual production, this happened at the dawn of the 19th century, but only for a time until Western nations started outsourcing industrial production overseas in the wake of the Second World War. But that is beyond the scope of this video. But if the cities didn't consume set products, where did it go? A common fallacy is that empires are unnecessary. This is wrong. When you produce as much as England did in the 19th century, you need customers. The population boom and demands for cheap clothes were a godsend to the British textile industry, but once demand was met, sales slowed down. Fortunately, Britain had a handy dandy empire that provided them with more customers. And because the Brits were the ones holding the gun, they could demand these colonies only bought British made textiles. Realize that in this era, protectionist policies got England out of the continental markets and vice versa. The problem with Merkelism, as this practice is called, is that it's self-perpetuating. 
Putting tariffs on national products mean the nation will put tariffs on yours, and so on, and so it goes. Thus, imperial powers attempted to milk their colonies as much as they could, barring any outside competition. It was these types of trade monopolies that led to the American War of Independence and many other revolts within these colonial empires. And, of course, cities played a crucial role, being the hub that connected the overseas territories through their harbors. With all this commerce, there was a lot of administration involved. In 1750, 55 to 65 worked in agriculture, up to 25 in industry, which was cottage industries, and around 10% in services, including clergy, shopkeepers, and bureaucrats. By 1850, only 25% worked in agriculture, 50% in industry, which are now factories, and around 25% in services, including the massive logistics required in running empires. This shift would continue well into the 1900s, during which nearly 40% of the workforce was employed in the service sector, and by the 1980s it was over 60%. This, of course, led to an infamous statement that the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the ever-expanding bureaucracy. To return to the question at the start of this video, who was right? Was it E.M. Forster in The Machine Stops or the meme machine that is Soylent Green? It's a sign of the divide in society today that has this popular hypothesis since the 60s. But here is the thing. There is no historical precedent for it. Here's another topic that people spoke about, especially if you were born in the 1980s. Declining birth rates. In those days, it was considered to be a good thing unless you were in your 30s when you realized that this trend threat to your pension and other social securities. And to continue a civilization, you need proper replenishment rates, something few countries outside of Africa currently have. 30 years ago, declining birth rates were often uh, attributed to Western prosperity. The belief was that many children were something associated with the poorer populations, rural rednecks in certain Asian countries, but not the virtuous, educated Western middle class. After all, the idea that having large families was necessary for economic security was considered outdated, even a myth. But this assumption turns out to be wrong. Today, it's most evident in Asian countries where birth rates have plummeted despite rapid economic development, and the West is now following suit. Now, while this reality is widely accepted, some still clamor about overpopulation as if it is some looming threat. Many names have been thrown around to explain this shift, being capitalism, statism, socialism, patriarchy, or even a globalist conspiracy by pushing alternative buck-flavored products. However, the real explanation is far less sensational. What we are witnessing is the consequence of well-established historical processes, that being high urbanization. When we step back and think about it, it's odd that we've come to a view where a short stretch of explosive population growth is considered the norm. The rapid growth of the past few centuries was, in fact, an anomaly driven by the Industrial Revolution and unprecedented advances in healthcare and technology. Now, as urbanization to continue to rise and societies become more advanced, birth rates are declining perhaps singling the end of that brief, exceptional era of growth. The unique conditions that allow for population booms are fading and it seems that the world is settling into a new equilibrium. But enough with the grim projections. Let's end on a more positive note. Among the services provided are art and culture. The city's elite have always been the patrons of the art, in particular the pop culture that shaped most of you watching this very video. The culture that created steampunk. Currently, Western entertainment is in a slot. It's just like the late medieval cities, the established companies are attempting to maintain the old system despite the obvious failings. Those unsatisfied with the current state in places like Hollywood are taking their businesses to the countryside like the entrepreneurs of back when and the internet. 
And just like that, we are in a new cycle of creative destruction, during which many creators are looking back at the past for inspiration to apply these ideas in new forms of media, be it games, movies or magazines. This is what some are calling the Iron Age of independent creators. And this is why you, instead of spending money on overpriced subscriptions, should support independent creators through crowdfunding instead, like ours for Nightwatch. Links are down below. We are going through a new industrial revolution. We can worry about the things we can't control, but we have a chance to focus on enriching our cultural legacy by supporting the artists we enjoy. The future, though different, might just be full of possibilities. Hey guys, this is Bonsert and as promised I've got something special for you. This weekend on Black Friday, the Casket Girls is for free available on Amazon as a ebook, of course. And uh, also, we have another special announcement. For some of you who do not know, we have a Ream page where you can read a lot of my short stories for free by following the page on the link below. But now, we also have a special offer for you if you ever wanted to support my channel. We now have our membership tiers at a discount. And on the higher tiers, uh, you'll not only get access to all our ebooks, but you'll also get an opportunity to get your own original art and the 3D printable miniatures for your 3D printing pleasure. So please go check us out on Amazon and uh, with uh, to get <laughs> the Casket Girls. And of course, check out on Ream for all those amazing discounts which are linked below. So go check those out guys. For those who celebrate Thanksgiving, I wish you all the best. Enjoy the time you have with your family. And uh, as always, make it your way. Good night.